You're listening to Talking Volumes. I'm Ruby J. Brown. We've been releasing episodes for a year, and in this time, the themes, ideas, and challenges we want to address have become clearer and clearer. But simply, we want to discuss alternatives to the ways we design, create, and inhabit space, both from historical examples and from utopian ideas. And what that means is changing the ways that we think about space, buildings, the city, and by extension, the ways we work and the structures of our families. None of these issues is independent. Seeking alternatives and asking what they might mean for us means thinking of space and design as something deeply interconnected with our wider culture, economics, and politics. It's complex and exciting. Leslie Kern is the author of The Feminist City, a book which, since publication in 2019, has sparked conversations between those who design the city and those who study it and who live in it, around the inequities and complexities of our dominant urban designs and ways of living, while looking towards more livable, more just alternatives. And the new urban world Leslie Kern imagines in the feminist city isn't designed in a top-down, universalizing way, like the utopian urban dreams of the mid-20th century. Rather, she seeks existing and historical pockets of feminist cities and asks what it would mean to extrapolate those models more broadly. In the UK right now, and across many parts of the world, much of feminist activism is confronting women's public safety in the city, notably after the death this year of Sarah Everard and last summer of Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman. Quick note here that this episode contains passing references to sexual harassment. This is while women and people of marginalised genders are generally most at danger in the privacy of their own homes and with the people they know. My conversation with Leslie begins by discussing the complexities of female fear. But by no means is the feminist city only about making public spaces safer for women. It's a significant reimagining of the ways we might live together and a reevaluation of different kinds of relationships and how they play out in space. What if the city were based in economic structures of care and acknowledging the multiplicity of different experiences, rather than being designed first for the six foot tall commuting professional man and accommodating everyone else later? Throughout this conversation, you'll hear us reference writers and design collectives who have imagined alternatives like this and often put them into practice. And to learn from the success of these projects where they've been successful is to acknowledge that if design is to have an impact on the culture of patriarchy, or even if it is to create space for resistance to patriarchy, it first has to change its own culture, move away from the notion of the master architect and do a lot more listening from the bottom up. So here's my conversation with Leslie Kern. Near the beginning of The Feminist City, you write that in everyday life, the statements the city is not for women and a woman's place is in the city are both true. The city has offered women new freedoms, cultural, economic, and political, and at the same time has often represented a certain fear. And I'm going to start with that fear because I think it really points towards the complexity of the issues I want, I want to talk about today. So most women and non-binary people can recall a series of conversations and messages directed to them from when they reach adolescence or even before of being told to carry keys at night and stick to wallet spaces, etc., etc. We, we all know by now these rituals of safety and fear that get embedded at a very young age and never really forgotten. I think far fewer men have similar conversations, but I remember being involved in them with my older sister and my mum that were not just about how my sister might behave in the city to avoid dangerous men, but also how I could be perceived as a threat as I reached adolescence. How I should cross the road if walking behind a woman at night and make my presence known by being heard and being seen. Now, all of this is in a background where men are far more likely to be the victims of reported public crimes like assault or mugging. But women report much higher rates of fear around being the victims of such crimes. And this apparent disconnect has been labelled in the past as the paradox of women's fear and been used to describe women as irrational. But really, you explain in the book that this is a, is a fallacy. So I wonder if you could explain here the reasoning behind this apparent paradox and what the effect of the fear disconnect is for women in the city. Sure. If we were to just look at the pure, seemingly rational statistics of where people actually experience violence and so on, then we might say, yes, that women feeling so much fear in urban public spaces and attaching that fear to strangers is illogical. However, when we look at all of the ways that women are socialized, as you mentioned, from a very young age, from girlhood, into believing that uh, strangers pose the greatest dangers to us, that we have to control our behavior, watch where we go, let other people know where we are, and so on. There's also the impact of media, where we see the kinds of crimes against women that we see reported in the media tend to be those sensationalized moments of very public violence from strangers. What we don't see reported is the day-to-day 
domestic violence that happens in uh, so many women's lives over a long period of time. But that also contributes, I think, to public fear because women on a day to day basis often live with very real fear and violence. There's also street harassment, which may not escalate into violence, but is a verbal or a visual reminder to women that they are being objectified, they're being watched, and that those moments of catcalling could potentially erupt into violence. And when we take all of those things together, it's probably quite logical that women do feel the amount of fear that they do, even though statistically they are less likely to be attacked in public spaces. But the effect of all of that is both a a kind of an accumulation of day-to-day seemingly minor effects of uh, thinking about where am I going to go? How am I going to be safe? Who am I going to tell? What precautions do I need to take? You know, always making sure your cell phone is charged or that you have money for a a taxi or an, an Uber now, or that somebody knows where you're going. All of those small inconveniences that over the time, I think, do add up to kind of a mental burden that women have to carry. But on a larger scale, I think it also impacts very real material decisions that women have to make. You know, where can I afford an apartment and is it in a seemingly safe part of town? What bus routes do I have to take to go back and forth between school or work? Can I take that job that is a night shift that pays well, but requires me to be out in public at night? So it it does create a very real impact on women's, you know, economic lives or social lives and so on. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to go to next, which is in the book, you also talk about how this idea of, of female fear is often used by developers, urban planners, policymakers as a kind of justification or marker of success for certain decisions. But that is often white, cis, middle class women for whom the success is about. So it's like, do this particular group of women feel safe in this place? So I wonder if you could explain the, the kind of political consequences of the notion of female fear for gentrification and, and racial justice in the city. Sure. When I was doing my doctoral research in Toronto, I was looking at condominium development and the way in which certain ideas about gender are kind of embedded in this process of development. And when I spoke to developers, one of the things that they talked about in terms of gender and women as condo buyers was we can provide this safety in areas of the city that women wouldn't normally be feeling safe within. But as you point out, and as I tried to point out in my research that This kind of safety, this privatized safety that comes from being able to afford to live in a secure apartment complex with a concierge, security guards, cameras, all of those kinds of things is only available to women with a certain amount of privilege and and economic power. But it contributes to kind of a neoliberal idea that people should be responsible for their own safety and that really you should kind of purchase that safety on the open market. But what that does, of course, is leave so many other people, including many, many women, out of any kind of access to safety and perhaps exacerbates the kind of unsafe living conditions that can result from living in in areas that are economically depressed, where there's a lot of poverty, where there's over-policing, where there um, isn't a lot of social services and the kinds of things that contribute to people having a a good kind of crime and and danger-free life. Mm -hmm. I think there are perhaps two strains to the sexism that the book talks about. And one is an economic and cultural freedom that that mass transit systems and schedules are not designed with women in mind, that housing is designed around heteronormative or or homonormative marriages and so on. And then there's the kind of culture of public sexual harassment of of cat calls, groping, uh, kind of male rape culture. And I'm interested what you think of of whether we should think of these two things as separate issues or, or are they part of the same trend? Oh, I absolutely think that they are very much connected. I think that the shoring up of the institution of heterosexual patriarchal families and marriage is very much accomplished by keeping women in a state of fear in believing that without the protection of the male figure, the father figure, the husband, the brother, the protector, that all of those strangers will suddenly emerge out of the woodwork or the dark alley to create chaos and danger and fear in women's lives. And I I think that this also contributes to hiding the epidemic of domestic violence because we spend all of our time focusing on stranger danger in public spaces without really making visible the sheer amount of violence that happens against women from people that they know, right? Family members, Mm -hmm. acquaintances, workmates, and so on, uh, where women are most likely to experience violence and, and harassment. 
So yes, I think the economic world, the social structures of the family and so on are definitely connected to rape culture in that it convinces us that we require these patriarchal structures in order to create a sense of safety or protection for women. Mm. And I might jump in here on the current moment of feminist activism, which I think is an interesting moment and is something that, in, at least in the, the reading of it that I take, contributing to that kind of disconnect between the reality of violence against women and particularly domestic violence and and then the kind of fourth wave feminism post-structural focus on on testimony. So I went to an event in Cambridge recently with Maya Tutton of Our Streets Now and Soma Sara of Everyone's Invited. And both these platforms have been quite successful successful recently in gaining audience and, and media coverage over public sexual harassment, and particularly at the cultural level of British schools. But the bulk of their public image, and, and at least their public outreach, is really founded in testimony about women's experiences. And so often these pieces of testimony are given about public space and given about the city. And this is the kind of thing that I've been grappling with and, and haven't been able to come to a, a conclusion on, which is how much this culture of public testimony is helpful. This is sharing of universal experiences, a feeling seen and heard, and how much is it hiding? I can see why you're grappling with it. I agree. It's a difficult question to pass judgment on. Mm. On the one hand, I would say, you know, there is an extremely long tradition of sort of feminist testimony, whether that comes out of the, you know, consciousness raising groups of the 1960s and 70s to today through social media and kind of more global activism. And part of the point of that is really the message of you are not alone because Mm -hmm. so many people believe that the experiences that they have are either their fault or they're the result of some kind of conditions that are particular to them and their interpersonal relationships or their personal circumstances. And without an understanding that, no, it's it's systemic, it happens to so many people and there are bigger reasons behind it that have nothing to do with your personality or your particular family, that's really powerful. That really gives people something to hang on to. So I would never want to dismiss that. But I would also say that whenever a certain kind of set of stories, even if they're coming from a marginalized group, whenever a certain set of stories become dominant, become the the ones that we hear all the time, we always have to ask, well, what stories are we not hearing? Whose voices are still being left out or much quieter in the conversation? What truths or realities do we not really want to pay attention to? And I think when it comes to things like challenging questions of like the family and the home, These are hard things to challenge, even when we know the statistics about violence and so on. They're so deeply held in our culture. You know, family is all good and all powerful and is an appropriate foundational building block for all of society Mm -hmm. that when we start to question it, you know, it's both kind of earth shaking in terms of society as a whole, but it's also very personally unsettling because it asks us to perhaps look at our own family experiences and review them in kind of a different light that might, again, be quite unsettling and maybe for some people even quite traumatizing to Mm. to think about. So I want to move on to talk about policing and how police culture and police practice supports rape culture and violence against women. And your Twitter bio is a feminist city is a police free city. And and I want to ask why that is today and, and what would replace police in a feminist city? Sure. Well, when I wrote Feminist City a couple of years ago now, I feel like it it had a kind of a solid police abolitionist vibe in that, in that I was quite critical of policing as a catch-all solution to the problems of women's fear and tried to take an intersectional approach that reminded us that, that for many women, perhaps for most women, the police have been probably a greater source of violence than they've ever been a source of safety. But I wanted to, through my Twitter bio, especially last summer with the Um, renewed Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of the the killing of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor to just really make that clear, to put a real fine point on that statement and let there be kind of no sense of hedging that, okay, maybe if we just change policing or maybe if we just make it more friendly to marginalized communities, it will somehow fix the problem. The alternatives are ones that we have to look to in both a short and a long term view. I I don't believe that all of our problems will be solved by instantly dissolving policing today because we don't have the other kinds of institutions and supports in place that make it possible for people to be fully supported, to be housed, to be well fed, to have good education, to have the health care that they need, the mental health care that they need and to have 
you know, good community support that really all of us require. But some of us, it just seems to come naturally to because of the privileges that we're born into, but so many people don't have. So I think, you know, calls to defund the police, that is what that's about. It's like, can we take the literally billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that go into policing and put it into those social services, into giving people safe, clean, affordable places to live, into great education systems, into environmental cleanup so children aren't drinking lead poisoned water. <laughs> like all of these things to me are the how we build safety from the ground up, right? You don't build it top down by controlling people, but you create the conditions at the base that allow people to live in such a way that that doing harm is becomes relatively rare. And yes, harm will probably still be done, but there are other, you know, more community focused ways of addressing harms that happen in communities that don't involve locking people up and kind of punishing them for sometimes their entire lives for uh, the acts that they might commit. So I definitely believe in an abolitionist vision. I've been learning more about that as I go. I'm not an expert on the topic, but from a feminist point of view, as much as we care about women's safety, we can't advocate for a, a kind of safety that would only benefit a relatively privileged uh, subset of women at the kind of top of the hierarchy. Hmm. And and coming from that kind of bottom up vision, policing is of course really deeply tied to to protest and resistance. And and one of my favorite passages in your book, which I found really beautiful, is about your first experience at a major protest in in Toronto in the mid nineties. And you write, "quote I'd never experienced my city in that way before. Taking over the streets, linking arms with strangers, expressing anger and joy and solidarity. I never wanted it to end." And when I read this, it reminded me of marching through my home city of Brighton in the UK in June last summer in a Black Lives Matter protest, was attended by ten thousand people, one of the biggest ever in the city. And we'd all been locked down for for three months at that point. It was the first time that the city had felt alive again for all that time. And it felt like the city at its best in so many ways. And I feel similarly about Brighton at at the Yearly Pride event, which is the biggest in the UK and not really the Rainbow Police Cars part of that event, but the kind of informal party that happens throughout the city that that is kind of transformational. Uh, And I I bring this up because you write that even as activist movements have kind of gone through the the hashtag era of Me Too and BLM and, and now into the kind of Instagram like carousel graphics era, movements still take to the streets at critical moments and cities are still the sites of successful social movements. So I wonder if you could say what what makes cities so vital for activism and protest and and what you've learned from activism that informs your thinking on the feminist city today. Cities are certainly not the only places where significant social movements can happen. However, they do provide some of those key ingredients, both the critical mass of people who either are feeling a sense of solidarity with the cause or who are directly affected by whatever the issue at hand is. They are also the places where we can speak to power. So whether it is an Occupy protest in front of Wall Street or Black Lives Matter protests in front of police headquarters or anti-globalization protests outside of the WTO and, and the meetings of the G8 and so on, we are physically in the presence of those who are making the decisions that are affecting people's day-to-day lives. There are also the places where we can gather media attention and where the events that happen can kind of go global and be captured by a national and international press. So those ingredients are, are found in cities and they really do make protests happening in those places quite potent. I think for me, the kind of education that I've gotten every time I've gone to a protest has been really important for thinking through some of the dangers of a kind of feminist universalism. I think you alluded to this earlier, a sense of, you know, there's a universal female experience that solidarity just comes naturally because we share a certain body or because we share a skin color or we share one particular experience. Uh, rather, I, I've learned that solidarity is not just sort of naturally generated, it's not a seed that just sprouts without any attention. It's actually a practice. It's something that you have to build. It's fraught. <laughs> there's there's tension. You have to confront your own privileges. But showing up is really one way to do it. And it's it's, I think, a very necessary first step to actually put your body where you're able to at least in a space of protest, action, engagement to show like I'm physically here, right? I, I want to be here. And without that, it's very hard to generate, I think, a true solidarity and a deeper understanding of what different people go through and of how we can participate in, in different movements that might affect us differently than, than other groups. 
Mm. And I think that point of solidarity building is, is really powerful. And I think protest is such a site of, of radical empathy in a way. I've been thinking about that with uh, the struggle of, of the Palestinians recently, that often that struggle is framed in this way by the political class, by the media class as being something way too uh, complicated for anyone to understand unless you're some kind of in the weeds foreign policy hawk, which, which may have an element of truth, but it also hides the kind of ground level human story that's happening, which is the pain and terror of, of being in the West Bank or Gaza and, and fearing for your life and seeing it, you know. And, and I went to a, a, a rally at Downing Street the other day and and it was just like this energy, this culture and emotion that was just human. And, and the more informal conversation that's happening there that you just can feel. That's so important to understanding these situations too. Uh, and one of the movements you discuss quite extensively in the book is Take Back the Night, also known as Reclaim the Night in the UK. Uh, and my mum went to Reclaim the Night process when she was about my age. Um, and I've had conversations with her over the last few months about how those movements and similar movements, uh, what they're fighting for today isn't much different to what they were fighting for in the 80s and the 90s. And she's quite pessimistic that the rape culture and the culture of everyday sexual harassment doesn't feel much better today than it was then. And, and I want to ask if you, if you agree, is the city more feminist today than it was when you first attended these protests? And, and if there's been progress, why? And if not, you know, wh- why not? I totally sympathize with your mother's position <laughs> there. When I was writing um, for Vox about Sarah Everard a, a few mm-hmm. months ago, one of the things that I wrote there was that the advice that we give to women is actually, it's not just, you know, 20 or 30 years. It's like 100 years, 150 years. It's the same advice, except now we say carry a cell phone, right? That's like the only change. It's the same thing, you know, go out with other people, like have your chaperone in the Victorian era. We don't call it a chaperone now, Mm -hmm. but it's the same kind of principle. Watch what, what you wear, be modest, you know, don't engage with strangers, Uh, stick to the places that are appropriate for you to go. Like it's the same advice. So (laughs) we could say how much has, has really changed at the same time. I don't want to be overly pessimistic. I guess some of the things that haven't shifted maybe as much as they need to are around like masculinity and, and what males public facing heterosexual cisgendered identities are all about. How much has changed there? That's really an area where I think we need to do a lot more work where men need to do a lot more work. I don't know how much more work women can put into that particular project at at this point. Some of the things that that have changed, I mean, I will say with those movements themselves, like Take Back and and Reclaim the Night, I think they have become more intersectional in their approaches in that, you know, when I was at those marches in the 90s, they were explicitly women only, but it really wasn't clear whether trans people were welcome in those spaces. The, the kind of neighborhoods that we would march through were often poor, racialized neighborhoods. And I wonder now about the effect that that kind of action has on those communities of saying, like, your community is the problem in a way, which now I think is a very kind of, you know, colonial and, and perhaps even racist way to go about doing those things. So I think the intersectional expansion of what those movements are about is a, a positive sign In terms of, you know, what has changed in the city, there is certainly greater awareness to gendered safety issues in cities. I I don't think there's really any major city that doesn't consider that to some extent, at least in their planning agendas, in their design portfolios and so on. It, It is not something that can be completely left off the table and left out of discussions. I think we still need to go a long way to sort of imagining things beyond like lighting Mm. and sight lines to think about, you know, you've been kind of talking about like deeper, like cultural change, right? So Mm -hmm. how can cities contribute to that at a kind of deeper level? That's not just about physical or visible design interventions. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. Mm. I think there's a uh, quite a lot in there that I will come back to. Uh, and first, I, I want to move on to the kind of a lot of people's favorite chapters in the book, uh, which is the city of friends. And, and in this chapter, you kind of draw on this idea of, of female friendship as a way of life, as as a radical kind of transgressive alternative to the city of men. And, and you tell this beautiful anecdote about how female friendship made freedom in the city a possibility for you, and in turn, the city intensified the bond with your friends. And I wonder if you could expand on how the city interacts with female friendships and, and what the consequences of, of female friendships as a way of life are. Mm. Well, I, I, I think in some ways, of, as we've been discussing, there's this, you know, the idea that, OK, women, uh, if we need to go out always with one another in order for protection, that this is kind of a form of oppression. And that is one way of reading it. But I think we can also read it a different way, which is that it's women kind of taking our own safety into our own hands. Right. It's collectivizing that it's showing care for one another. It's creating those bonds with one another that are not 
dependent on men that are not dependent on sort of patriarchal services like the police and so on. It's it's women kind of doing it for themselves. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And I also kind of want to reclaim that story of around women's safety, you know, how women kind of take things into our own hands, create our own solutions, are, are creative and generative in, in terms of the way that we can not just protect one another, but create good experiences for each other in the city. And you know, kind of from that seed of, you know, maybe the almost banal everyday activity of like gathering your girlfriends together and going out for for a drink, we could think about that as a kind of more world making project. Like, Mm -hmm. what if we imagine that kind of writ large, Mm -hmm. right, in Mm -hmm. terms of who you would create family with, right, Or, or how you would define family in a more expansive way beyond romantic partnerships? How could we imagine different ways of living, like physically living together with different configurations of households, How can we be open to the fact that for most of us, those will change quite radically at different phases through our lives and not always in a predictable kind of union friends to living on your own to marriage and partnership to death, right? Like there's uh, probably a lot more variation in there that our current systems don't take into account. But friendship is one of those relationships that we could highlight a lot more and think about, well, if we were to you know, imagine a city that was based around friendship as a key relationship, how would that change the way that we structure our cities and city life? Mm, I think this point is really quite radical and I want to stay with it a minute because when I was reading this passage, it reminded me a little bit of Valerie Solanus's passage on friendship in the Scum Manifesto. Valerie is a tricky figure, often derided and dismissed as being insane, not helped by her famous shooting of Andy Warhol in 1968. But I think there's incredible prescience and depth to be explored in her writing. Just for listeners, the SCUM and the SCUM Manifesto is an acronym for the Society for Cutting Up Men, and in it, Solanus advocates for eliminating money, instituting complete automation, and destroying the male sex. She justifies this by claiming that the Y gene is an incomplete X gene, so the male is an incomplete female. I think this idea is at once hilarious and totally brilliant. Uh, She was writing in the 1960s and was far from politically correct even then. And in this passage on friendship, she writes that love is not dependency or sex, but friendship, and therefore love can't exist between two males. She goes on, Love can't flourish in a society based upon money and meaningless work. It requires complete economic as well as personal freedom, leisure time, and the opportunity to engage in intensely absorbing, emotionally satisfying activities, which lead to deep friendship. Our society provides practically no opportunity to engage in such activities. And I bring this up because as a man reading your book, I found that it never quote unquote spoke to me. You weren't writing to men, which is rare and I think important and exciting for academic writing. And of course, the non-male gendered experience has to be centered, as you've said. But it leaves open the question of what is the role of men in the feminist city? And uh, are men even compatible I mean, with the I, feminist city? For, for all of the um, struggles, if we will, or, or limitations of hegemonic masculinity, I definitely hold to the view that while sexism doesn't oppress men and women in the same way, that sexism is a box that very much limits the potential of men for full emotional expression, expression of their identities, for developing different sorts of relationships, for, you know, the way that they parent, for the kinds of work lives that they imagine for themselves, the contributions that they want to make to society. And of course, uh, around, you know, very limited range of uh, acceptable expressions of sexuality, right? So, that box is one that, you know, I want to bust open for everybody. <laughs> um, it, it's it's so damaging to men as well. Again, not in the same way as it is to women. But if we don't break that open for men and create a much wider range of opportunities for how to be a man and for a range of masculinities and a range of gender identities that people can aspire to, then we're we're really missing out on something. And I think, you know, Valerie's point about like an impossibility of friendship between men. I, I don't believe it's an impossibility, but I think empirically the, the research shows that as men get older, they <laughs> have very few friends. Their friends are like their wives, friends, husbands, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or someone that they chat to at work. But those kind of mm-hmm. like deep emotional connections with friends that maybe they've had at various points in their lives tend to fall away over time. And often older men are very lonely because they don't have that connection. And as, you know, people start to die or family moves away and so on, they're really left with very few options for those connections. And I really think that's, that's a shame. Every man should, should want that, you know, friendship is not just a part of a women's world. It's just women have had 
slightly more opportunities to maintain them than, than men have under our current you know, culture and system. Mm. The British columnist and journalist Owen Jones makes a really great argument about this in a, in a video he made after the murder of Sarah Everett, uh, which, which tied the culture of male homophobia to the culture of, of sexual harassment. And, and it was this idea that men, fearing that they might be perceived as gay or feeling threatened that their masculinity might be in doubt, combat these fears by demonstrating their heteronormative, cisnormative maleness by performing acts of sexual harassment and, and rape culture and saying, I'm a man because I subjugate women. And again, it's that part of that really limited view of masculinity. And, and Solana said that the only men who would be saved from scum were those who admitted that they were indeed women. And that idea is really the structure of her manifesto, writing that everything from war and marriage to suburbs and ugly cities were the creation of a man as a defense against his desire to be female. I, well, I was going to ask, I wonder what your thoughts on that are, and, but I, I think you've kind of given it. And, and to temper that this is a, a male cultural problem and that the work of doing that is, is really on men. And I admired your, your book as in some way a celebration of deciding not to do that work. <laughs> you know, to not, to not speak to me. Because I saw you at an event held by the Architecture Foundation in, in November where I kind of asked a version of, of that question. And, you know, I've been thinking about it since then. It's like, I think Owen Jones's take on, on the limits of masculinity and actually like understanding masculinity as a, as a male project is something quite powerful and important to do. Mm. But I also think that this is where your, your book is kind of utopian at times. And I, I really like your or vision of the feminist city is something that can grow out of pockets that can kind of be transitory and fragmented and, and incremental. I wonder if you know about Ursula K. Le Guin's ideas of the of the yin utopia. Uh, not in as much detail as I should probably. But. I mean, yeah, she, she, you know, she was amazing and, and kind of something else. Uh, she was a sci-fi writer, but she has this this essay where she argues about the codependency of utopia and dystopia, and and really how almost all utopias are these masculine yang utopias that are really top down, technocratic, and rigid, and kind of baked in, in patriarchy. And even if they appear to ensure gender equality on the outside, they often kind of ignore the complexities and multiplicities of the different experiences of life. And this kind of somewhat includes scum, I think, and goes all the way back to like Thomas More and the 1516 utopia and beyond that. And Le Guin instead proposed a yin utopia, drawing from indigenous communities and practices from Northern California and, and laid out in her book called Always Coming Home. And it, and it was a utopia based in, in care and myth and nature. And it was really something very non-urban. I also think that like William Morris's use from nowhere, kind of romantic and bucolic is somewhat yin utopian too. You write in your book that we needn't inherit universalizing grand visions or utopian schemes in order to start making things different and better. But I think also that female friendships as a way of life is a beautiful kind of utopian intention in a way. And, and it made me think that maybe the feminist city can be both against universalizing grand visions and be based in a form of, of feminist utopianism. Uh, I wonder if you agree and, and kind of what's the role of utopia to the feminist city? I think utopias are, and I'll use that in a plural mm, sense, mm. deliberately they're absolutely necessary as a, a set of ideas because I think that we are so often constrained by sort of narratives of inevitability, narratives that, you know, people like to say, oh, there's no outside of capitalism. And I understand why we say that, because we want to acknowledge that, you know, there's no way that any one of us can sort of perfectly live like an anti-capitalist or non-patriarchal or anti-white supremacist life in the context that we're in. Yet at the same time, I don't want to fully cede that much ground that there is no outside mm -hmm. of these things. And so I think when we can keep hold of the idea of utopias, then what we're saying is we do believe there's an outside. We don't always know exactly what it will look like. And in fact, sometimes over defining the end point is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to get kind of too bogged down in a predetermined vision of the future. But really a utopia we could think about as process, right, as a way of kind of moving towards different things. And so in the book, you know, on, on the one hand, I think sometimes people think that maybe I kind of copped out a little bit by like uh, not providing more of a, a grand vision. And I keep getting asked about that. But I also think that what I wanted to point to was the fact that wherever there's a problem, whatever it might be, people are always already working on it, right? There are already people generating solutions, trying to do things differently. Um, they just are not the kind of things that get attention or million dollar grants from, you know, some huge agency, right? They're people like just taking care of each other in their communities, planting gardens, <laughs> creating different housing options, whatever it might be. It, it's always already there. And I think there's so much to learn from that. You know, I think during the pandemic, we saw a greater recognition of mutual aid, which I didn't know very much about before the yeah, pandemic. Either. I think many yeah. people didn't, but it, it's existed for, for a long time. It has roots in black and immigrant 
communities like Black Panther, activism, you know, free lunch programs, all of those kinds of things. So it's been around for a long time. It was just sort of like, oh, actually, maybe we do all need this. We are all interdependent. It's not just for some people who are currently marginalized, like it's for everybody. Mm. We all need it. I want to move on to, to that question of design in the feminist city and really with a focus on process here. You've written extensively about the potential failures of creating standards for urban safety as standards will standardize and ignore the obvious and inherent multiplicity and diversity of people and spaces. So different cities, different neighborhoods within cities, different streets within neighborhoods are all diverse, both by people and geography and, and require an individual approach. And I've been thinking about the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act in, in the lead up to this conversation and similar international legislation and the wave of accessibility standards it, it brought in. Uh, like saying that a ramp must be a gradient of less than 1 to 12 for someone to be able to propel themselves up in a wheelchair, introducing curb cuts and electrically assisted doors, things that make the city more accessible to everyone, by the way. And I think it's understood that these standards, while not perfect, have been broadly successful. Planners and designers might seek similar standards for issues of urban safety, women's safety in the city. But whether someone feels safe and comfortable in a given space is perhaps a much more complicated question. It's not about ergonomics and whether you can get up a ramp and press an elevator button, but something that deals with all the kind of complexities of a phenomenon like women's fear, as we've begun this conversation with. So you gave a talk at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture in October last year where you laid out, instead of new standards, a new process for urban design with new assumptions and new starting points, which you prefaced by saying are wildly obvious but require repeating. And the first of these is that the minority is the majority, the niche is the whole. Could you explain that for us here? Sure. Well, uh, so many places, whether they are buildings or transportation systems or, or the city itself has been designed around the idea that there is a kind of standard, like universal, usually male, able-bodied, kind of cisgendered subject that is the norm that we should kind of design to this standard. And then the everybody else, whether you use a wheelchair or you're a child or you are a woman or a different size body, you are a deviation from that norm. And maybe we will then like later (laughs) find a way to accommodate you. But what I'm suggesting is that actually when you look around at at cities, at the world as a whole, that all of those groups that we have called special interest groups, whether again, we're talking about parents, disabled people, people with with mental illness, very young people, very old people, um, racial minorities, recent immigrants. Taken together, we're the majority, right? There's no niche there. And it's not that everybody has the same needs, but that when we build in, you know, greater both physical accessibility, but also a kind of sense of inclusivity to spaces, then we are affecting a much greater number of people. So yes, I definitely would would kind of push designers to, to stop thinking about kind of one subject as the kind of central user of their spaces, but to imagine that more widely. And, and I agree. I mean, it's hard to think of what the, the pure sort of standard for design around something like women's safety would be. But I would also say that a lot of those things, even the, the kind of the physical accessibility elements that come from like the, the Americans with Disabilities Act and its iterations in, in other places around the world, go a long way towards safety, right? Because they, they do actually create places that are more inclusive, that more people can enter and be part of. They create a greater sort of set of systems that people can access in public space, whether those are like call buttons or having people that that can help or different entrance and, and exit points and just more people around tends to tends to help as well. Mm. So, you know, I think we can definitely look to that as not the whole story, but part of the solution. And, and this is kind of part of the, the question of what the feminist city is grappling with and, and working against is patriarchy is a, is a culture. And design has fairly little ability to change culture and, and to move it and is more often a, a reflection of the dominant culture, money and practices for which it was designed. And you write the quote, ultimately, I don't think we can rely on urban policy and planning to sustain or generate the kinds of spaces that allow non-traditional relationships to flourish. And, and I broadly agree. As I've been thinking about this conversation, I've been kind of grappling with, with that role of, of what the architect or the, the planner has here. And have at times is quite pessimistic. But at least where I'm at now is that the thinking of design and culture as these two separate things is is really too simplistic a model where actually design has its own culture informed by the wider kind of societal culture. So so rather than changing the design, we have to change the culture of the design and how the design gets made in the first place. And you said in a panel event recently that you've had many conversations with architects and planners since the book's release. And I wonder if any of these conversations have have left you with a sense of what a better culture of design might be. Mm 
One of the things that I have relatively recently learned about is the world of um, design justice. So I, I would definitely recommend any you know planners, architects, designers out there check out Design Justice. In particular, there's a book called um, Design Justice by Sasha Costanza Chalk, and there's a whole Design Justice network. And they take a very broad view of design. It could be about tech, it could be about buildings, be about public spaces, be about programs, systems, interventions. And just like you said a minute ago, there's that recognition that there are so many biases that tend to be kind of pre-built into the very objects that are around us, whether it's, you know, the way a door opens and closes or a much broader, uh, you know, the algorithms that feed us our data and <laughs> extract data from us and so on. Yes, all of those biases are in there. So the, the point of design justice is to work in a different way, as you're kind of suggesting. It's, it's not just about the end product, but it's about thinking about the process, the culture, of design in a different way that is very equity oriented, that ha takes an intersectional approach and that believes that everyday people are also the, the experts on what things they need. So mm -hmm. it's not, you know, an app designer or an architect coming in and saying, hey, you know, you feel unsafe here. So let me create an app that will fix that problem for you. But it's going and saying, what would make you feel safer? Is there a technological aspect of that that we could work on? Is there a design aspect? Is there a physical environment aspect? And building that as a very collaborative and ground up approach where it's not the architect or the designer is the expert with the knowledge to save people, but that, you know, together we bring the, the skills and strengths that we have to the table and generate solutions that that kind of come from a very participatory and, and horizontal process of design rather than a kind of top down expert led design. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and I wanted to put this in the world of where I'm at now in the kind of communities that I'm involved in. And I've just finished the first year of an architecture degree. And, and when I'm set a design brief, I go and research the site and the people and the culture all from this kind of outsider perspective. And then I have to produce a design for a building that somehow ties all these things together. And this culture kind of goes back to the Corbusier and the grand universalizing visions of the modernist masters. But I've been critiqued in the last year at times for not having agency over my own design. You know, that's a kind of like a direct critique that I've had. And, and, and meaning that it appears I don't fully believe in my own singular vision of this place and this building. And, and really, I find it hard to believe in my design when I'm not the one who's going to end up using it. And I kind of say this because I'm being taught how to design buildings in a year group of 50 students, nine or 10 of whom are men. So there's plenty of non-male people in the room. But it seems that the way I'm being taught to design my first principles are really top down. That's a culture. That's a kind of an yeah. epistemology. That's a, a, you know, like a, a hegemony that's being taught to me from the beginning. And that my first principle is to go top to bottom and that I am the master of this design. And, and really my vision of what architecture should be and what an architect should be today is a facilitator of a community's desires that I go in and make sure that it stands up and that it doesn't burn down. And you, you bring this up in the Columbia talk about giving communities control and kind mm. of practices of co-design. I wonder if you know about the 80s architecture collective called Matrix. Yes, I certainly do. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm not an expert on their history, mm -hmm. but, you know, I first became aware of them, I think, in graduate school when I stumbled across the book Making Space, which was put together by the Matrix Collective, which was a group of women working in design professions, including architecture, that really wanted to both expose the kind of masculine biases that were underlying so much of urban planning and, and building design and to think about, you know, what would be some feminist principles be behind that. So, yeah, the, the Matrix Collective's work was, I don't want to say first, but maybe more widely known <laughs> work that started to really clearly articulate like what a feminist intervention in, in modern architecture would look like. There's a really great exhibition on them at the Bobbican Centre right now that I went to last yes. week. And this exhibition really focuses on, on process, like we've been talking about. And, mm -hmm. and effectively, they flipped the role of the architect and, and became the facilitators of community design. There's these lovely stories about them going on brick picnics with uh, mothers from the Bangladeshi community in Tower Hamlets, where they go and look at different buildings and then go to the park together and like go over material samples. And it was all about clarifying the jargon that architects use and actually making it really simple to be like, we want a community center where, where mothers can meet and, and have conversations about their community. Previously, they were using a space where 
the children were in a room, like there was a kind of play space, but it was unrelated physically to, to the kind of meeting space. So mm. it's like mothers can see their children, they can hear their children. And it's like, it's so simple and really obvious if you just went and, and had that conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I truly love to see this kind of practice and, and the education of architecture move more in that direction. And I think it's optimistic that there are these frameworks and there are these precedents of process rather than kind of objective that might be the way towards a more feminist design practice. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I will be um, giving a talk uh, via the, the Barbican exhibit in, in August about, about Matrix and, and the feminist city as well. So I will have the opportunity to tie more of that together. Well, that might be a, a good place to wrap up and um, I'll watch that talk for sure. Thank you. Leslie Kern, your book is The Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. In the UK, it's published by Verso and will be linked in the episode notes and on our website. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks very much. Thank you. It was a great conversation. I appreciate it. This episode of Talking Volumes was produced in Cambridge by me, Ruben J. Brown, with help as ever from Ewan Russell and Freya Dugan. Everything referenced in my conversation with Leslie Kern, from Design Justice to Valerie Solanus, will be linked on our website, talkingvolumes.co.uk. If you're in or near London at the moment, Ewan and Freya and I went to the Matrix exhibition recently and can all highly recommend it. Maybe on your way there, you can listen to our recent episode on the Barbican Estate itself. This format is a new one for us, and one we hope to do again in the future, but we'd love to know what we can improve, or if there's people we should be talking to. Our email is talkingvolumespod at gmail.com. Please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It can really help us reach more listeners just like you. If you want to stay tuned for updates and more episodes, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Talking Volumes. You'll hear from us soon.